Hello, everybody. So we're always on a tight timeline to start here because we are, we have uh, many people on virtually, so they're waiting. So we always start right on time. So thank you. Um, so good evening, everybody. I'm Lisa Krauser. I'm the Edward W. Kane Executive Director here at the Concord Museum. I've met many of you, but if I've not met you, please come up and um, say hi. I'd love to um, get to know everybody here. I want to thank you all for joining us tonight, both those who are with us here in the Churchill and Janet Franklin Lyceum, um, and to all of our virtual viewers as well. Um, it's a pleasure for me, for me to introduce tonight's forum which is a conversation with historians Jacqueline Jones and Kelly Carter Jackson. So Jacqueline Jones is Professor Emerita from the University of Texas and is the author of several books, including Labor of Love, Labor of Sorrow, Black Women, Work, and the Family from Slavery to the Present, which was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize and won the Bancroft Prize in the year it was published. Tonight's forum will be centered around Professor Jones' most recent book, No Right to an Honest Living, The Struggles of Boston's Black Workers in the Civil War Era. The Kirkus Review writes that the book is a brilliant expose of hypocrisy in action, showing that anti-black racism reigned on both sides of the Mason-Dixon line. Professor Jones has won numerous grants and awards, including a MacArthur Fellowship from 1999 to 2004. She was a past president of the American Historical Association and served as vice president for the professional division from 2011 to 2014. Professor Jones has become a key resource to the museum since moving to Concord a few years ago, and we're thrilled to have her serve as on the museum's Education and Public Programs Committee. Our moderator this evening is Kelly Carter Jackson, the Michael and Denise Class of 68 Associate Professor of Afri Africana Studies at Wellesley College and author of Force and Freedom, Black Abolitionists and the Politics of Violence. We are delighted to welcome Professor Carter Jackson back to Concord after hosting her for a forum soon after the publication of Force and Freedom in 2019. Professor Carter Jackson is a commissioner for the Massachusetts Historical Commission, and she sits on the scholarly advisory board for the Gilder Lerman Institute for American History. She is also a historian in residence for the Museum of African American History in Boston. Professor Jones will begin the program with a short reading from No Right to an Honest Living, then she'll be joined in conversation by Professor Carter Jackson. At the end of the forum, we'll have time for a few questions from the audience, and Professor Jones will sign copies of her new book, which we're selling this evening thanks to our partnership with the Concord Bookshop. So thank you all so much for joining us tonight, um, both here at the museum and virtually. And please join me in welcoming Jacqueline Jones. Thank you. Thank you for that nice introduction, Lisa. I'm so happy to be here this evening. Welcome to you all and to those who are in Zoomlandia. I'm <laughs> Um, uh, before I begin, I want to give a shout out to the Concord Museum and also to the Robbins House here in Concord for their uh, ongoing excellent work in local black history. So, um, and actually, Lisa, I'm not going to do a reading. I thought I would do just a very brief overview of the book. <laughs> um, and I took the title, No Right to an Honest Living, from a speech given by John S. Rock in 1860. Uh, Rock was originally from New Jersey. He trained first as a dentist, then he became a physician. He was a public lecturer. He ended his career as an attorney. His uh, career path was uh, representative, actually, of uh, well-educated uh, black men and women in Boston at the time. Uh, he did give a talk in March of uh, 1860 when he said that um, abolitionists, white abolitionists in the city uh, paid uh, much more attention, cared much more about the suffering enslaved workers of the South than they did about their own black neighbors in the city of Boston. It will not do to judge men by what they say, he advised, urging people of color to demand deeds, not words from white abolitionists. Men and women, he said, who spoke movingly about the sufferings of bond men and women, but showed a studied indifference to the impoverished black community in their midst. Now he declared, I believe in insurrections, and especially those of the sword and the pen. Addressing white Bostonians in general, Rock said, that is the idea. 
Colored men have no right to earn an honest living. They must be starved out. So over the last few years, there's been a really impressive historiography on the um, black struggle for civil rights in New England, uh, with an emphasis on the fight for suffrage, for integrated schools, the right to intermarriage, to serve on juries, but very little attention to the issue of labor. And that's um, even despite the fact that work, of course, was a central everyday lived experience of black men and women. It was a major focus of black political struggle. It was an issue with implications for family life. And it was a preoccupation of 19th century reformers from abolitionists in the antebellum period to labor activists and activists in the progressive era. So again, even though uh, work is um, a, a significant and a, a central uh, element of black history, uh, most historians have been focusing on uh, legal uh, civil rights. So I thought it was time to turn our attention to work and uh, there are three themes that emerge from the book. Uh, black workers were largely confined to menial labor um, during this period, 1840, and I go up to 1900, despite three major 19th century upheavals, the New England Industrial Revolution, the Civil War, and the emergence of the commercial re retail sector. So uh, basically, black men and women as workers were doing the same thing in 1900 as they were doing in 1840. Over their lifetimes, most black laborers contended with irregular, low-paying jobs because a whole host of potential white allies refused to press for just working conditions and opportunities in private homes, businesses, on city public works projects, and in the US military. The third theme, black men and women showed a great deal of resilience, creativity, and resourcefulness in making a living and sustaining their families, at times in ways that were not documented in the census or other formal or official reports dealing with the social division of labor. So most black women during this period worked as laundresses or as servants in hotels or private homes. Most of the men worked as porters or tenders. Tenders were kind of all around janitors, messengers, errand runners, or as hawkers or servants. Uh, and I think that the main theme here, especially with uh, the male workers, was their constant search for a few hours, a few days, maybe a couple of weeks worth of work. So they um, had to go from place to place, shop to store to hotel um, to factory, looking for work, washing windows, uh, scrubbing the floors, that sort of thing. And I found in the account of Anthony Burns, who was a very famous fugitive who fled from Richmond to Boston in 1854, an account of his search for work in Boston, which followed this um, Again, this peripatetic um, uh, wandering through the city from place to place. I also, in the book, though, look at the struggles of uh, high profile leaders during this period. I look at uh, Joshua Bowen Smith, a caterer, Robert Morris, an attorney, Christiana uh, Carto Bannister, who was a hair doctress. Uh, as well as Louise de Morty, an elocutionist. And the main theme here from these very accomplished uh, and mostly well-educated men and women was that they needed white patrons or customers in order to survive and do well. But they were the exceptions, obviously, here in Boston uh, with the respect uh, accorded them by uh, whites in many respects. So uh, who are these white allies that showed the studied indifference toward their black neighbors? John Rock said in that speech of March 1860, faithful friends are hard to find. And I looked at six particular groups that I thought had good reason to care about economic justice for black men and women during this period. 
We have to keep in mind, though, that the black population in Boston was very small during this period, no more than 1% or 2% of the total population. So as I mentioned, uh, white abolitionists and other private employers uh, shunned black workers. And uh, white shop owners said, you know, well, white customers won't come into the shop if they're waited on by a black person. Uh, and abolitionists said, well, we don't, um, and others said, well, we don't want to upset our white workers. If they don't want to work alongside a black person, we don't want to provoke them by hiring uh, black people. Another group, Republicans, uh, the Republican Party founded in 1854 as an anti-slavery party, not necessarily a black civil rights party, but we might expect them to um, care about justice for a key constituency of theirs, black voters, during this time. And yet again, uh, white Republicans, both before the war and after the war, were not uh, interested that much in appealing to um, employers for justice for black workers. A third group, white workers, uh, reformers, labor reformers, union heads. Um, again, if you think of the potential threat posed by black strike breakers, it would make sense for white workers to uh, invite them into the workplace, invite black people into their unions and, uh, and guilds and other kinds of working class organizations, and yet that was not the case, even though Boston had several really um, key uh, labor leaders during this period, including uh, Ira Stewart, who led the Eight Hour Day campaign, Frank Keese Foster, who was cigar maker Samuel uh, Gompers, founded the American Federation of Labor in 1886, Jenny Collins, was an advocate for white women factory workers, showed very little interest in uh, black women workers at all, and in fact denigrated domestic service as a kind of work. She said it was degrading. The white women who were the employers of servants were penny-pinching, mean-spirited women, very difficult to work under them. Um, and another person, actually, who wrote a whole book about um, the quest for the dignity of work among white women was Louisa May Alcott. Check out her novel called Work, uh, published in 1873. And she, too, portrays domestic service as a really awful kind of job. But it's during this period that, um, well, after the Civil War, at least, that hundreds of black refugees from uh, Virginia you come to, uh, begin to come into Boston. They're sponsored by the Freedmen's Bureau. And they uh, come with the specific goal that they will work as uh, domestic servants. And there is a preference then among these refugees for women and girls, because the idea is that they will serve in the places that white women have abandoned. City officials, too, uh, you would think since many black uh, workers were taxpayers, and you might uh, ask, how could that be since they didn't own their ho own homes? But uh, you could be taxed if you owned um, furniture, uh, personal property. And that's how many black workers uh, gained the franchise. They paid a tax, $1.50 a year, because they owned some furniture. And they did vote. Uh, they paid taxes, they voted, and yet public works projects uh, were limited to white men exclusively, especially uh, when these projects began in the Civil War um, and going up through the early 20th century. Another group I thought that might uh, care about economic justice for black people, Union soldiers and veterans. 180,000 black men served in the Union for the Union uh, military during the Civil War and yet uh, and received lesser pay than their white counterparts until quite late in the war. Uh, white men got $13 a month for serving. Black men got $7 a month for serving. Uh, and that was not changed until July of 1864. But after the war, uh, white veterans segregated their organizations and uh, were certainly not a force for equality 
and justice uh, for black workers and veterans. And finally, progressive social settlement workers and academics in Boston were really in the forefront of developing a kind of scientific racism and justifying, in fact, uh, the fact that black men and women were excluded from factory work throughout the New England region. Um, John Daniels wrote a book um, in the birthplace of freedom about blacks in Boston in 1900. And he noted that um, you no know, black people worked in factories or in shops really of any kind. And he, um, he, he couldn't figure this out, but it was of course because um, employers had not hired black people in the past and the ideology uh, gradually grew up that they, they couldn't be hired, they couldn't run machines, they couldn't do the kind of technical work that the factory um, demanded. So what I've done here is to, I've looked at these potential white allies and found them lacking um, in all of these cases. But uh, the book is not just a description of uh, forces of discrimination against black workers. It is also a testament to uh, these workers' creativity and resourcefulness in making their own jobs in some cases. Deacon Cyrus Foster uh, put on a concert every year and uh, gave a speech. Uh, and some whites ridiculed him for his grammatical errors and so forth. Uh, but I think the real fools here were the, the whites, in a way, who would pay good money uh, and made Cyrus Foster a, a fairly wealthy man in the process. Fugitive imposters. These were um, um, people who pretended to be runaways from slavery but were actually freeborn, threw themselves on the mercy of white and black Symp sympathetic people. Um, these uh, faux fugitives had to have a good narrative. They had to have a heartbreaking story about their families left behind in the South. It was, um, they're really very skilled uh, in a performative sense, I think. I looked at rat catchers, those who go into the stables to catch rats that are used in the uh, dog uh, rat fights in these pits in Boston. Uh, I followed Joseph Clash, who was a saloon keeper. He was really quite an amazing person. He was a businessman. He was a musician. Um, he was also a barber. But it was his um, American Hall in the North End that uh, garnered a black and white male and female crowd every night. Uh, there was usually some kind of knife fight or pistol gunfight uh, outside. But um, he was wildly successful. And even though he was a violent man himself, whenever he was brought to trial, the jury would always um, uh, acquit him because his um, establishment was so popular among blacks and whites. I look at pickpockets and pickpocketresses. <laughs> Those are women, <laughs> pickpockets. Um, scam artists, sex workers, card sharps. Um, and I make the point that these um, people should not be listed um, exclusively under criminals, but should be listed as workers, because they're trying to make a living uh, from what they do. I also uh, consider the household strategies of this impoverished population. Often these poor families would take in boarders to help support the household. Often adult children would remain with the their adult uh, parents so that they could contribute to the family even uh, once they married. Um, I looked at fraternal orders and mutual aid societies that helped with medical and burial expenses. And finally, church groups, too, could provide a charitable assistance to the poor. So we see this, these strategies and these webs of mutual support that help with um, uh, sustain these uh, very poor populations. So um, how does a focus on work if enhance our way of viewing familiar themes? I looked, for instance, at uh, the work of women as um, uh, un their unwaged work, the work of Octavia Grimes, who was a minister's wife, the work of Harriet Hayden, who with her husband, Lewis, took in 
fugitives from slavery and hid them. At one point in their um, West End uh, home, they had 13 fugitives. And that, as you can imagine, it was Harriet Hayden doing the laundry and the cooking and the cleaning for all 13. Uh, we can look at the uh, priorities of black abolitionists. And um, as Kelly shows in her book, uh, those did not always align perfectly with white abolitionists. And certainly we see uh, Frederick Douglass, as well as John S. Rock, taking white abolitionists to task for their hypocrisy in not pro uh, promoting uh, black employment in white workplaces. We can look at the hardships endured by uh, black abolitionists. I looked at Sarah Parker Ramond and her brother, Charles Lennox Ramond. Uh, Charles, in particular, spent a lifetime out uh, promoting abolitionism. And after the war, uh, the cause of black suffrage and women's suffrage paid very little uh, at all, even though he had a family at home to support. So, we tend to focus on these leaders and their eloquent speeches without realizing the challenges faced by their families at home. And two, I look at uh, military veterans and uh, uh, soldiers and sailors during the Civil War. Uh, and I see, um, again, uh, if we look at them as workers with a particular pay scale, particular working conditions, uh, having to answer to bosses, striving for promotions, um, working under very difficult con conditions. Uh, I mean, we can really look at military service as a kind of labor, as a kind of work. And there we find that military service in, very, in essential ways mirrors civilian work in terms of the low pay, the lack of uh, possibility for promotion, um, service under white bosses or employers and uh, military officers in this case. Um, I also consider what I call the Boston diaspora, which is um, the uh, trend among some black men and women to go south after the Civil War. Uh, I look particularly at ha Harriet Jacobs and her daughter, Louisa Jacobs, who went to Alexandria, Virginia, and then to Savannah, Georgia to uh, open schools for free children and adults. And um, the failure of the post-war Republican Party, I think, is a major theme of the book. Again, a party we associate with Abraham Lincoln, racial egalitarianism, really uh, faltered when it came to economic justice. And even though uh, many black men remained loyal Republicans during this period, they were not rewarded commensurately with spoils jobs the way their white counterparts were. And finally, um, I found that income was not necessarily pegged to pre prestige. And I look particularly at a number of black uh, preachers uh, in Boston during this period. Leonard Grimes is a good example who he presided over 12th Baptist Church, which was called the Fugitives Church. He was very active as an abolitionist, as an activist himself. He was a leader in the community, and yet his family struggled because his congregation was so poor. So in many cases, these preachers are dependent, of course, on um, their congregations for support. And many of these preachers had um, very poor um, congregants. So um, I just wanted to end by saying that um, one of the amazing um, quotes I found uh, in the course of my research was from, of all people, a white congregational minister and Civil War chaplain, Charles L. Woodworth, who began his uh, career as a minister in Amherst, but came to Boston as a leader of the American Missionary Association. And he wrote a pamphlet in 1867 called The Enfranchisement of the Negro, which went way beyond the issue of suffrage for black men. He focused on the institution of bondage as critical to the economic foundation of the nation. Invoking the Southern freedman, he declared that, quote, the gains which we have made out of his unpaid labor demand on our part an equal restitution. 
More than any other man, he has produced the raw material out of which the wealth of the country has been created. Yet for over 200 years, this worker had not received any share of his rightful earnings. Woodward declared, his labor has furnished the seed from which have sprung the manufacturing villages of the country. From the cotton raised by his hand, thousands have spun their fortunes, while every class and every industry among us has felt the quickening impulse, and the whole land has smiled under an unexampled thrift and plenty. Woodworth wrote, give him back that of which we have robbed him, that which he would have been at that which he would have been but for our injustice. And he is no longer a slave, but a man and a citizen. Capital has made sure returns. Disguise it as we may, we have grown rich by robbing the poor and mighty by taking the energies of the weak. He was talking here to Boston, which had made so much money off the international slave trade during the 18th century and off the cotton trade that fueled the mills in Lawrence and Lowell during the 19th century. Added to this great injustice, he um, said, was the shameful treatment accorded black soldiers, especially because their courage helped to win a Union victory. So I just uh, hope that you uh, agree with me that the study of labor, uh, the ways of making a living, is a very particularly uh, fruitful and rich topic for historical research covering virtually every aspect of black family and community life in Boston during this period. The Civil War was a traumatic event, but it did not affect the racial division of labor in Boston. The separate low-wage division of labor was not a natural historical process, but the product of decisions among many groups of ordinary white men and women in concert with employers, clergy, and political leaders. In spite of barriers to economic justice, black men and women showed resilience and resourcefulness in creating their own jobs and pooling their resources as members of extended kin groups, churches, mutual aid societies, and fraternal orders. And we should remember and honor their struggles, not only as freedom fighters, but as workers as well. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Whoop, oh. <laughs> oh, <no. Whoops. laughs> Hello, good evening. Uh, Let me shut this on. Does so, everyone hear me okay? Okay, great. Um, first, I just want to say that was fantastic. Like, I got a chance to read uh, an early version of your book. I'm keeping my cell phone here so I can keep track of time. Um, and let me know when we're, we should get close to questions. But um, this book is so good. It's so rich. It's so chewy. You know, and when I say chewy, I mean like there's so many different aspects that you cover of labor and life. And I think it fills such a void because when I think about the abolitionist movement, when I think about Boston, I think so much is discussed about the life of the enslaved. So much is talked about in terms of the coming of the Civil War or Reconstruction or suffrage and voting rights. And we forget about the worker. We forget about how labor um, is really at the heart of everything. When I think about Du Bois' reconstruction, it's really about labor issues. Yeah. Yeah. And so um, I'm super excited <laughs> that this is being tackled and in such a rich way. Um, so I want to ask you a question. I know that you wrote this book primarily during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And I was thinking about <laughs> during the pandemic how people were quitting jobs, people were becoming essential workers that we did not necessarily think is essential. And I think we all had to grapple with new ideas or maybe like buried ideas about how we should think about labor and how we should think about work. And I want to know, what is the origin story of how you came to this? Did you, while you were writing during the pandemic, were you thinking about these ideas while you were well, writing? Well, I was in the sense, um, that you know the essential workers you mentioned, the nurses, mm -hmm. um, teachers who now had to work under such difficult conditions. These are fairly low-paid people mm -hmm. <laughs> in our society. You know, mm -hmm. I remember when my kids uh, were at school, and I would write their teachers a note at the end of the year, thank you, and I would say, in a 
just world, you would be making yeah. lots of money. Yeah. Um, and they're not. And that, I mean, it reminded us of how skewed I think mm -hmm. we are when it comes to um, you know, compensating people who do uh, labor that is just life affirming. Yeah. So that's, that's one thing. Um, I started the book before I knew there was going to be a pandemic. Um, I, had written a, I had written a book on Savannah, Georgia. And um, I, I started in the antebellum period. I went through the Civil War. And then I went um, through Reconstruction because I found that a lot of historians will um, maybe stop in 1860 or mm -hmm, they'll maybe mm -hmm. uh, pick up in 1865. Mm -hmm, so they'll look mm -hmm. at antebellum or Reconstruction. But I wanted to kind of. Look at the whole, um, the whole, you know, scene there mm -hmm. uh, in Civil the mid nineteenth century. Yeah. Yes, the whole era, and I did find some really interesting uh, connections between Savannah and Boston. So, mm -hmm. in January of eighteen sixty five, with the Civil War still ongoing, by that time Savannah had uh, been liberated by mm -hmm. Union troops in December. Boston got together and raised a tremendous amount of money to send mm. uh, for charitable purposes to the city of Savannah, even though they wow. were still, you know, the Confederacy was still standing at that wow. point. And, you know, the reason why, because um, when the Union forces came into Savannah, they found 30,000 bales of cotton. And these mill owners in the hinterlands here in New England, they wanted to get their hands on that cotton, wow. and they thought they could ingratiate themselves with Savannah, wow. um, Savannah leaders. Mm. So it was, yeah, wild. it was. Uh, <laughs> so, wild. but I was, I was really uh, shocked that you know they would, they uh, raised a lot of money, they sent a lot of food mm. down. The, the ship captains donated their time, the ship owners donated their ships, and it was quite a relief effort there in January of 1865. Wow. This is funny to me because, okay, so last year I taught a course on understanding American um, slavery and racism in the North. And we spent the first half of the book really talking about slavery in the North and the second half talking about racism in the North. And I think, first of all, the book's going on my syllabus. <laughs> it's excellent. But I don't think my students or the general public are aware of Southern sympathies in the North oh, towards yeah. the Confederacy. Yeah. I don't think they're aware of just how discriminatory um, the North was in terms of, you know, hiring practices. And um, and I also think that there is, you know, there's always the running joke about like, oh, Boston is so racist. But like what you're telling is really an old story about how we should think about New England writ large in terms of discrimination practices and racism and how that played out in a city that still pushed abolitionism in a city that's still seen as like the city of like there are two different narratives yeah. happening at the same time yeah yeah can and you the explain city, that yes exactly i mean the city really was very conservative yeah and the abolitionists made a lot of noise out of proportion to their small numbers yeah yeah so people thought oh uh, uh, boston's an abolitionist city the site of radical well it wasn't it mm -hmm. was actually a very few people who were giving a lot of speeches and mm -hmm. making a big fuss from you know pulpits on sunday but in general i mean we're talking about a very lucrative trade of new england fish mm -hmm. shoes plows harnesses being sent south and lots of cotton yeah being sent north, and that cotton, of course, fuels not uh -huh. only the New England economy, but the whole national economy. Yeah. And that's what C.L. Woodworth was saying, that these bonds between north and south mean that you know the north has gained much by slavery, and we need to recognize that. Yeah. And I will also add that you know a lot of Southerners would come north during the summer to Saratoga Springs mm -hmm. or to Newport, and a lot of Southerners and Northerners were um, bound by extended kinship yeah. lines. So there are, and they you know especially those on the uh, coasts like. Boston, New York, Philadelphia, Charleston, Savannah, they think of themselves as a coastal elite. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, they yeah. uh, send their kids to Princeton. To and Harvard. Harvard yes, you know, yeah. And they, um, they really feel that they have a lot in common. And mm. so the war, you know, I, I, I looked at these merchants, um, you know, in Boston on the verge of the war, and they just couldn't believe that the South would be so stupid as to kind of 
kill the goose that laid the golden egg. It was mm -hmm. very profitable for both sections to have this yeah, cotton yeah. economy still. It's, it's true. I mean, I don't, I think we think of slavery as being regional, but really this is a national mm -hmm. enterprise that people are participating yeah. in. Um, I wanted to sort of ask you about something that intrigued me the most, which is these underground um, economies that black people are having to create because of the lack of opportunity. And there was something that you said, I want to make sure I have it correct, where it's that, you know, the idea is that you have black people who wouldn't necessarily make a lot of money being a doctor caring for the black community, but they could make a lot of money being, say, a barber mm -hmm. taking care of yeah. white patrons. Yeah. And so the things that we think, you mentioned yeah. this as well, are prestigious, the doctor, the lawyer, the preacher, um, the yeah. preacher right. they're not making any money. Right, right. And I mean, they have, there's a social status, but there's no yes. economic incentive. Yeah. And that's why John S. Rock, who was very erudite, I mean, his mm -hmm. um, lectures were on French literature and uh, history. He, he was very well read, very well educated. He began as a dentist. Well, a lot of people in Boston couldn't afford a dentist. Yeah. They just couldn't. And so he retrained. He, be, he became a physician. Again, um, no whites would patronize him. He, mm -hmm. he did turn to public lecturing for a while. And then um, during the Civil War, he began to practice law after training in that regard. And he was the first black man to be admitted to argue before the uh, yeah. US Supreme Court. Yeah. So it gives you an idea. And he was also during the war an amazing broker who, you know, help people apply for deferments and help widows mm. get charitable assistance and that sort of thing. But I was amazed at, you know, there are exceptions like uh, jo Joshua Bowen Smith, the mm -hmm. caterer, Robert Morris, the attorney did have black clients and also um, Irish clients. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, again, if you had white clients or customers or patrons, you were bound to be better off. That was not true of the, of the preachers. They had only black congregations and they had to rely on them for a living. And one of the examples I gave was Peter Randolph, a very talented um, man who really just went from congregation to congregation in search of a stable mm. s source of living. Mm. Yeah. But the, to me, the, the idea that even these um, sort of like black markets, brothels, mm. if you will, prostitution, it still work. You yeah. know, it still works. It's sex work. It's, it's, yeah, yeah, sex work, right. it still work. I yeah. mean, the ways in yeah. which people are trying to carve out spaces for themselves to make money, and some people do become highly profitable off of mm -hmm. working in those enterprises, I don't sort of think we think of the underbelly of the economy yeah. in which black people are having to navigate yes. and carve out these spaces in which they're not allowed to be in. Um, and you talk a lot about the resistance that black people are using. Is there a story or a person that you know really <laughs> stuck out for you? Well, it's Joseph Clash, yeah. this, um, the dance hall owner. And he, yeah. was, he was just such an amazing purpose person. I, one of the best descriptions of his... Um, establishment comes from uh, an article in the Boston Herald. A reporter and a police officer went to his establishment one Saturday night, and the food was fabulous. So they give you a description of the food and the dancing. He was a musician too; he played the viola or something. Um, and he and there were dance girls, you know, who you could dance with them for a nickel, and then they would, you know, scam you later in the night if they could. <laughs> Um, and there were prostitutes too there, and there were card sharps playing, you know, illegal gambling games. I mean, it was the most amazing place, but again, it had a black and white, male, female, rich, poor clientele. Mm -hmm. uh, but it really did represent what I call kind of a multiracial underground commons mm. <laughs> in Boston. That is a place where lots of different kinds of people could meet in mm -hmm. pursuit of illicit activities, yeah. whether it's drinking, gambling, prostitution, or whatever. But, you know, the, um, the title of the book is No Right to an Honest Living, meaning mm. some people are going to turn yeah. to what is a dishonest living. Yeah. And another thing that I thought is incredible, too, is that um, when you think about people that were impersonating fugitives or mm. when people were, you know, being deceitful, lying about the, the, the person that they really were, 
in order to gain sympathy. So it seems as though the North had a lot of South for, for a lot of sympathy for people who were enslaved. And they also regarded people who were enslaved as um, harder workers, mm -hmm. you know, like, oh, they're, they're more happy to do it. They don't give you a lot of, you know, back chat. Like there was this narrative about formerly enslaved people that was like, yeah, well, they were enslaved. You're lazy though. You know, like the idea of black people in the North were being lazy, which to me is just incredible. And it right. reminded me too, of like even in the 20th century, how you had white Northerners who would look at the South and they would say, oh, the South is so racist. The South is so bad. But people in Boston, they just don't want to work. You know, like well, there's a, a misplaced like cognitive dissonance. Yeah, exactly. And as I said, these um, white abolitionists were kind of obsessed with this notion. Yeah. It, these fugitives, I look at uh, a group of free people who came out of Virginia. I call them the Edlo 66. They arrive in 1847. These are formerly enslaved people, and all they can think about, um, Samuel May and William Lloyd Garrison, is can they support themselves? Will they work? Well, yeah. you know, these are people who have literally slaved their whole lives yeah. and now, you know, are kind of cast into Boston, expected to find jobs on their own. And Garrison had absolutely no interest in them. He never mm -hmm. did, he never followed up with them. Mm. Um, but it was this kind of obsession, and then we see that applied to free people in the South, right? Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, well, they worked under the lash. Are they gonna work of their own accord after they're free? This is one of the great questions of the day. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah. it really was a central preoccupation of yeah. whites. Yeah, you really get a sense that there is a complete misunderstanding of black capacity, black humanity, let's just say in terms of like how white Northerners thought of black people as workers, that there was a deep distrust in their ability to either do a job or do the job well, or that they weren't somehow worthy of a higher wage or worthy mm -hmm. of being compensated or the a same promotion. as- promotion. Yeah. Yes, or promoted, yeah, yeah in places yeah. of leadership and yeah. things of that nature. Yeah. Yeah. You talk about skilled versus unskilled yeah. labor. Um, I also don't think we think about like who is getting the good jobs um, and that tension of economic competition, especially between Irish immigrants. Yeah, like yeah. there's this whole, um, everyone is sort of working against a stigma in a mm -hmm. lot of ways. Yeah, yeah, and the Irish are so numerous and quickly become a major constituency of the Democratic Party. And then after the Civil War begin to get uh, city jobs, mm. uh, eventually firefighters, police officers, school teachers, in a way that black folks don't. Again, they're a small number. The Irish become very prominent mm -hmm. in uh, Boston and it's, and in the process, you know, just exacerbate these um, these racial inequities. Really. Yeah, you said a lot. I'm gonna make sure how are we on time. Are we? We got one more question, I think, before we open it up for um, questions. Okay, so I wanted to talk about um, this is on the first page. Uh, there is a idea that I use a lot in my class. It's a quote from James Baldwin, and he. Um, is talking about what it means to act and to be committed within a movement. And I use this quote a lot. He says, to act is to be committed, and to be committed is to put yourself in danger. And then he says, and the danger in the minds of most white Americans is the loss of their identity. And I wondered, in reading this book, does acting in the interest of black people put white people at risk? in terms of their either their superiority or in terms of their loss of power or position, is that the real fear that if we open up the doors, if we act on what we think should be our core beliefs, that white people will lose out? Yes, it seems to be a zero-sum game. Mm -hmm. You know, whatever black people gain, white people must lose. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, mm -hmm. That idea, and you, you, I mean, it depends on which groups of whites you're talking about. Certainly white workers feared an influx of Southern black people who mm -hmm. might take lower wages. Yeah. And they wanted nothing to do with uh, black people in the workplace. White employers didn't want to hire black people because they were afraid their white workers would either leave or go on strike or cause yeah. problems. Um, I mean, in, in every step of the way, white politicians feared uh, advocating for blacks uh, because they thought they might lose white supporters mm -hmm. in the process. So 
it's yes, the fear is there, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. nobody really is brave enough, mm. <laughs> um, really, to say, well, I don't care, you know, that yeah. if I lose votes or if I lose workers, if you know, yeah, I don't yeah, care yeah. because this is the right thing to do. I don't really find much of that. Yeah, and that's <laughs> that's what's a little depressing <laughs> is that I think the myth that I'm often, you know, confronting with my students is this idea that the North is this moral superior place, morally superior, or that it somehow treated black people better, that these ideas were something that were a Southern phenomenon or a part of a slaveholding phenomenon. But I mean, this idea of competition is rampant all throughout and distrust. Um, and you see it play out in story again and again and again. And some of these white abolitionists do not look so good when they are when they're being confronted. I mean, the first, um, in the introduction, you talk, John S. Rock is calling out these white abolitionists and saying like, listen, you guys are not, um, you know, doing your, your part of the bargain, basically, right. and holding up these principles of equality. Right. Um, and William Lloyd yeah. Garrison was the same. Yeah, and yeah. And actually, uh, Frederick Douglass in 1853 made the same point about Garrison. And people were shocked, you know, yeah. that he would take Garrison to task for that. Yeah. yeah. And I mean, they, well, we know they have a falling out and all they, of that yeah. stuff, too. But I think right. part of that is yeah. Douglass not being willing to subordinate himself mm -hmm. to, to Garrison. Yeah. Um, I know we have maybe like 12 minutes left. I want to open up for <laughs> questions from the audience. Does anyone have uh, questions for Jackie? Or on the Zoom, too. I don't want to forget about the Zoom audience as well. Yeah, right here. <laughs> I'm imagining I was a reference librarian and you came up and said, here's this book that I want to write. <laughs> <laughs> Where, can you help me get some sources? How? Mm. And I would have gone, yeah. Mm. <laughs> so how oh. did you start? Yeah. Um, That's a good question. Well, you know, there is so much online these days. And one of my chief sources was digitized newspapers. Mm. So, um, mm -hmm. yeah. You would be amazed at all the Boston papers that are online through Genealogy Bank, uh, th uh, through Ancestry.com, um, through Newspapers.com. I mean, I, I tell people if I have to be, if I had to be um, isolated on a desert island <laughs> and I could only have one website, what would it be? It would be Ancestry.com. Yeah. <laughs> uh, because, really? Yeah. <laughs> yes. Because uh, all the census material is there. Mm. Um, uh, a lot of stuff related to the Freedmen's Bureau. I got almost all my Freedmen's Bureau material for, through the Smithsonian site and through the Family Search site. That's another um, site of genealogical resources. But the newspapers are great because you can. Say I want you to you know I want to survey the Boston newspapers, and I'm typing in black worker or work mm -hmm. colored worker or Negro worker, and see what comes out. I mean I had a, just such a wealth of information mm. that and I couldn't have paged through those newspapers on my own. So the um, the Library of Congress has a tremendous amount now online. Um, I mean, I really was overwhelmed with the online uh, sites. Mm -hmm. So that's good. Loving this. Yeah. So were those mostly? Sorry, and were those mostly the like the Bay State Banner or the Black newspapers? That comes later. No, that's no. after my time. Um, Bay State Banner. Do you know when that started? No. No, no I think no, it's the early 20th century, yeah. maybe. I don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. But these are, no, this is the Herald, and then mm -hmm. uh, later on after the war, the Boston Globe, but lots of mm -hmm. other little papers there uh, at the same, same time. Wonderful source, very rich source. Mm -hmm. That's a great question about sources. Other questions, right over here. <laughs> Jackie, this is great. You raised mm -hmm. so many questions. And mm -hmm. I mean, one just observation that I think you could really provoke is that we do all the celebrating of white abolitionists, but for a great many white for a great many white abolitionists, what was really at stake was they were being hostile to other whites. You know, they thought they felt themselves superior to whites, and blacks were the object. 
in their so-called philanthropy. Right, they they were objects of benevolence. You know yeah. the 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 images of the mm -hmm, um, the mm -hmm. slave beseeching the yeah. white abolitionists, and I I think you know white abolitionists they did feel um, they were beleaguered. I mean, in Boston, mm -hmm. I give an account of a meeting in 1860, and it's meant for. Uh, black abolitionists to talk about what, you know, how can we destroy slavery? What can be done? And it's also meant to celebrate uh, John Brown as a martyr mm -hmm. who was hanged in 1859. Um, and it turns into a big brawl yeah. because <laughs> these, these white politicians yeah. and merchants are, are just, Curious. we're going to shut this place yeah. down. This was in... Uh, uh, Tremont Temple. Tremont Temple, mm -hmm. yeah. And it was, um, and to me, that was kind of the Civil War of Boston, right? That it, it turned violent, that people were throwing chairs mm -hmm. and screaming and grabbing and fisticuffs. Frederick Douglass was there, all the other prominent black abolitionists were there. But um, the whites, uh, Theodore Parker did not show up, neither did Garrison. I mean, they, mm -hmm. I think they wanted to avoid the controversy because they were already under attack, right, from their white peers. Mm -hmm. uh, Garrison was not, you know, he wasn't wealthy the way Wendell Phillips was. There were a lot of class yeah. issues, there were class issues there as well. Yeah. yeah. If I can just add, yeah. I just, uh, it's so funny how mm -hmm. I have not thought deeply enough about how we think of these white abolitionists and these black abolitionists too, and I hold them in high esteem, mm -hmm. but you don't realize how much financially they're struggling mm -hmm. <laughs> for money to make yeah. a living to, yeah. to keep up this work. And I think we also have to ask ourselves our questions, like how committed would we be to a cause right. if we were broke, if we couldn't eat, right? If you couldn't if your sort families of... were suffering in the process. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah. And so it, I think that complicates the advocacy yeah. even more because yeah. it's not always just about a commitment to justice. And I will say just this one thing about Garrison. He was a brave person physically, you know. He was dragged through the streets of Boston. He was mm -hmm. uh, excoriated by other whites. In the 1830s, he threw his um, support behind the idea of a black school that would train black men and women uh, to get better jobs. But then he begins to realize how expensive that school will be, <laughs> yeah. and that it will take money from mm -hmm. the abolitionist cause. And he feels, you know, those dollars are finite, right? Yeah. And he, so he kind of shunts that whole project to the side, and he focuses on the Liberator, the mm -hmm. paper, which was always desperate for subscribers, mm -hmm. and on the abolitionist causes generally, and gives up this idea of um, a school. Yeah. 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 Is there another question? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. The, the book is really wonderful. And um, what well, many of us in Concord working really hard? The quote you read right before you moved over about be, you folks need to be honest with yourselves. There's many of us mm -hmm. in this room and throughout the town are working hard to make sure Concord is more honest mm -hmm. with mm -hmm. itself about mm -hmm. how you know, the economy of the town was successfully yep. based in the back of enslavement, that our mills here were running cotton, mm -hmm. um, that we weren't good to our free black folks, um, that this continued to the 20th century. Mm -hmm. We know the sage across the street. We have some really interesting writings of Emerson we can read in his quotes, and we know that there were... Um, the minstrel shows in the center of town as late mm -hmm. in the 20s and 30s. So as we're trying to fix this, any advice for us for us mm -hmm. in this town that you live in about ways we should be telling this story, <laughs> things we can do to help us tell a story of Concord that's not in love with itself, but a more mm -hmm. authentic understanding of who we are mm -hmm. as a town? Well, um, last fall, I was part of a League of Women Voters of Concord and Carlisle initiative. Um, and the first panel of four, um, Bob was on that, and uh, we had other speakers going over the history of the town um, and looking at the role of Jamaica, for instance, uh, slave plantations on Jamaica, mm. helping to fuel the Willard <laughs> wealth here mm. in town. Um, you know, th those, um, those opportunities to learn about the history are so important. As I said, the Robbins House is working to bring those stories in. 
you know, as Maria Madison said on that, uh, that panel as well, you know, these are not large forces exclusively, enslavement, migration. These are individual men and women, you know, and who fell in love, tried to, you know, support their families and find work. And it's those individual stories, I think, that are the most poignant and the most um, moving as we, you know, yeah, think about this as a community and what it has or hasn't meant for different groups. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh, you're looking at me too? <laughs> I, don't know. I mean, I, th I think I echo that sentiment. I mean, when I'm teaching my slavery and racism in the North, we go to the Royal Plantation, uh, which is in Medford or Somerville or mm -hmm. Redford. Um, and they're always sort of surprised by what it is that they're learning. And even all the way up and through to the 20th century, I think that, I think Boston and New England in particular has always been good about promoting exceptions or exceptional people, so like Edward Brooke or Deval Patrick or something like that. But when it comes to the collective, that's where the real struggle is. And I think it's very similar in the 19th century. Everybody loves Frederick Douglass, but it's very hard to you know see that love transferred um, to Douglass's um, peers and, and fellow black people. So um, yeah, but being honest about that, I think is the first place to start. I think we might have time for maybe one more question. Yeah, I think one more. One more I'll ask it of you if you don't, if yeah. you want to go in the answer. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering how long, in, certainly in the 17th century, black people. Who <laughs> <laughs> was that loud mouth guy? <laughs> uh, I, I, I recall that in the 17th century here in Massachusetts, uh, black people, in fact, were incorporated into um, the churches. To be sure, they had to sit on the balcony, but that, that is to say they were brought in and, and um, you know, made part of the thing. So that, I suppose, in, in one way, uh, increased the salary of the, the, the preacher, right, because the white people were playing, and, and they, that allowed the black people to come in and not put the money in the pot, uh, that kind of thing. But they still stayed there. And I wonder how long that, that, that operation exceeded. How well, in the, by the late 18th and early 19th century, black people have formed their own churches. It's yeah. humiliating to be segregated mm. in a house of worship. You aren't mm. equal enough to us. You have to go up to the balcony. Right, even I don't care how old you are. You know there are images mm. of very frail, elderly black people ascending to the balcony. Black people mm. want their own churches. They want their own preachers. And what, mm. when, when does that break? Late eighteenth, early nineteenth century, mm -hmm. 19th. when they break away from these white churches and their unequal practices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 Thank you. Yes, Kelly. this was so good. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone, <laughs> run, not walk, run to get no right to an honest living. <laughs> not just this book, but all of your books oh, have been so, you. so good. And have really made an impact in the field of history. Oh, we you. cannot say enough about what you have contributed to the field. We're thank so, you so grateful. Much. Uh, thank yeah. you so much for this conversation, everyone. Yeah. <laughs> this is so fun. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, you. Yeah. Oh, right, right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, we'll be in touch. Yes. 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 Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, I got married in the Arboretum. No, you didn't. Yes. Many, many years ago. That's my husband right there, Jeffrey. He's trying to keep a low profile. Oh, yeah, yeah. Did you meet Avril Lavigne? We did in the car catalog in the library in 1976. In the, in the car catalog, yeah. Yeah. That's a perfect Thank you. Yeah.